This week on the podcast, I did my best not to fangirl over Walter Kern. If you don't know him, you should. He is a novelist, literary critic, essayist, and editor-at-large of the new print-only newspaper, County Highway. I remember watching him close the beach, go the out beach. and grab some poor surfer yeah. off the freaking beach in California, and I went, anybody who can see this and then still take this damn thing seriously has made a choice. They're not just stupid. They're not just brainwashed. When I saw people going back into the trance after these trance breaking absurdities, like arresting somebody on a beach, I went, they want to be in it. They mm. like it. They like it. It's comfortable. It's the PJs. It's the PJs way of being. Here I am in the middle of the herd, in my PJs, in my soft chair, in front of my computer, with my phone. I got my music playing. I could live this way. And whatever edicts that they use to make this world possible and excusable, I'm going to stay in it. This is Walkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisey. I'm Bridget Fetisey, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. If you like our work and want to support us, the best way to do that is join Fetacy.com. You'll get access to behind the scenes content, outtakes, discounts on merch, and the ability to submit questions for some of our upcoming guests. Support your favorite scrappy little internet heroes at Fetacy.com. All right. I'm with Walter Kern, everybody. Welcome to Walk-Ins. Welcome. It's so exciting for me to have you because I am personally a huge fan of yours and I, I'm going to try not to fangirl over you a little bit. <laughs> oh, go ahead. I get so little of it in my daily life. I, you, uh, I, I, <laughs> you're one of, I feel like, just such a interesting and under known percent personality in this media space. I just, I wish that everyone was listening to you. I know you have a podcast with Matt Taibbi. And so you have a, a big uh, listenership there. And a lot of the people who are in my subscriber community are also big fans of yours and Matt's. And they were very excited you were coming on the podcast. And I have some questions from them that we'll get to at the end. But they're also very excited about your new Endeavor County Highway, which I will show to our viewers, a real life paper. You can yes, touch it. Yes. What inspired you to start this project? Well, I started it with a partner named David Samuels, who's a writer and journalist. Um, I think he's a, associated with Tablet Magazine in a lot of people's minds, which he and his wife uh, helped publish. But it was really David's idea that we start a 19th century style newspaper, the kind of place Mark Twain would have written for, and that we center our attention on the middle of the country rather than the edges. And that doesn't mean it's a paper about the South and the Midwest, but it means it's about places outside the big metropolitan zones, which we'll cover too, but we'll cover them only as other towns in America, the equivalent of Toledo or Springfield, Missouri, or, you know, wherever, Reno, Nevada, because I think our sense was that the country had lost touch with itself, uh, mm -hmm. you know, especially during COVID. Um, there was a lot of regional uh, fragmentation and figure, finger pointing. Um, the, the, the people in the media centers we're constantly telling stories about the middle of the country, how it was devastated by COVID or not taking it seriously or you know, not masking up properly. And over the years, I, I think that um, middle America, as it were, which is kind of an invention of the East Coast mind, really, yeah. um, uh, because middle America, I like to say, starts at the Hudson River and goes all the way to, you know, <laughs> Maybe it stops at West Hollywood, yeah. Uh, but but I think it's still there in Eagle Rock, if you know the Los Angeles yep. geography. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we also wanted to be 
mm, we don't think of ourselves as Luddites, but I suppose it's fair to call us that in that we wanted you to read something uh, in a medium that doesn't track you, that doesn't uh, count your clicks, that doesn't have to um, uh, pander to the sort of things that internet journalism does in order to get numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we hoped that you would sit around, pass this paper to whomever, uh, leave it lying in the local cafe if you're done with it, and create a new internet of hand-to-hand, -hand, person to person interaction. You know, it's really interesting because I've been slowly reading it because you are putting out six in a year right now. So yeah. I've been just slowly digesting it because I'm trying to time it until the next one comes. I just, it's like a good book that you don't want to end, which is a huge compliment. And it's also a little jarring. I was noticing the other day I was reading one of the articles. Um, it was all about kind of the the robots punishing you for a wrong thing. And right. it was something about reading that in print and not online was oh, giving me anxiety. I found myself getting anxious reading this very well-written piece about a dystopia that we're entering into technologically in print. And I don't, and I really don't, I am having a hard time articulating it because it's something I observed just while I was sitting there. That's one of the most fascinating reactions that I've heard because you're talking about, you know, we have, we have a, a big editorial, we call it a Jeremiah, where people are, are really uh, writers are asked to rant at, at, at length and without boundaries. And this is a piece about the sort of big tech octopus that is trying to clamp itself around our minds individually and socially. And uh, that is a fascinating comment that when you read it in print, you sort of see it from the perspective of the the older world, oh. the world that the world that preceded it. I just got and chills. So, it just gives yeah. it gives me like it, it was like reading something from another time. Yeah, that's that's exactly what was happening. It was like this very strange psychological disconnect of reading this thing that's happening in real time, technologically in print. Wow. So that makes me uh, think as an editor of the paper that we should do a little more of that, that we should confront the new world using the technology of the old to create that sort of what, what they call in theater an alienation effect where you, you, you see it in a new frame. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're so used to hearing the internet crouched about on the internet. Right. Um, that, that it's, and it's almost become... Uh, a, a numbing, invisible way to critique the internet because it's it's inherently uh, contradictory to use the medium that you're deploring to deplore it. Yes. Um, but to come from the outside gives new impact. So uh, you've just given me a mental note that I'm going to pass on to our our people. Good. I I mean yeah. it was it's something I've I just like to. One of the things that I love about reading print, I still like books. I'm still one of those crazy people who, even though Kindles are lighter, when I travel, I travel with lots of books because there's something I love about the tangible aspect of turning pages and print and the way they smell. And I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite in that, in that sense too. And I, I always like to notice how I feel when I'm reading something. And one of the things that I've noticed that struck me in this new age is that I don't really feel when I read something digitally in the same way that I do when I read it in print. It's a, it's a different... I might feel outraged or that like dopamine, but it's not that same. What, what struck mm -hmm. me reading your paper, it was in my belly. You know, there, the, the feelings were in my, in my, in a, they were centered in a different place in my body than 
more in my head. And Mary Harrington writes a lot about like the disembodiment of our modern era. And it's it's my it's my great theme as a writer, really. I mean, since the novel I wrote up in the air, which was to, you know, published in 2001 and is remembered as a book about airplanes, but is really a book about uh, virtuality in mm. general. Um, and its hero at the end ends up alone with his his phone, um, talking to his phone. Um, and uh, I, I think you're absolutely right that County Highway situates you in your body because it takes novel physical skills to read a paper, mm -hmm. turning, the, <laughs> turning the pages, um, You've got that feeling of paper in your hands, something sort of delicate. Uh, and the also, I think the lack of uh, multimedia stimulation when you're looking at a paper, it's just black and white. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not getting ads. You're not getting that sort of radiation <laughs> off the colored <laughs> screen. Um, the blue so, light. Yeah, so so that, the, that, that you had a kind of intestinal reaction, I think is... Um, proof that we're, we may be on to something because we want to address people at a level deeper than just the phone life that we all lead. Because the thing about reading on your phone is that you do everything else on your phone too. So it all melds together. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the journalism feels like social media. The social media feels like journalism. It all feels like, you know, uh, advertising and uh, of a kind. Um, it's where you put your photos. It's where you get your texts and emails. And so it all turns into this kind of uh, mental soup uh, for you. Yes. Um, and, and County Highway and a newspaper pull you out of that uh, trance. Yeah, it's very unsettling. I, I find the trance, I've been talking a lot about this just in the sense that I've felt very disembodied because I am a writer and a co whatever content creator. I don't really even like to say that because I, I think I originally considered myself an artist of some kind. And that seems like a pretentious term now, but that I feel like that's something, you know, I've been thinking a lot about AI and how AI can spit out content, you know, it can make content, but AI can't tell a story about getting sober, like my story, you know, it, it, I mean, sure it could, but it's not going to be the same as somebody who experienced the pain and devastation of addiction and the struggle of going through recovery. It could simulate it, but it's not the same. And I do think that when I try and put this stuff online, it feels like something, you know, you get caught in like metrics and downloads and subscribers and all of the numbers. And, and, and then even I've had Matt on the podcast and we've talked about this idea of kind of audience capture and how do you, how do you guard yourself against this because you're being subtly manipulated by these algorithms that are, you know, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to, to think that I could outsmart something that billions of dollars has gone into creating to basically manipulate me. And I think we need more mm -hmm. of this stuff, like what you're putting out there, but how do you, how do you kind of break this spell with like the younger generation? You know, we, we might be the last generation that appreciates this. Well, you know, when <clears throat> I'm, I, I've got a sort of Eastern European pessimistic side, which allows, <laughs> you know, when you go dystopian, I go apocalyptic. <laughs> um, I, 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 I can match anybody's cynicism with my own and, and, and beat them handily. But at the same time, I do entertain optimistic scenarios about humanity and, and, the, and the mind. And one of our great allies as people is our um, desire for novelty. Mm. And, and one of the reasons I think that even the young people, uh, boy, does that sound old, the young people can be rallied to the, the, the cause of new old fashioned media is that 
it lights up a different part of the brain and is exciting only in that it's different. Mm. And, you know, people, people don't want to be in a rut. They don't want to be in a groove. Uh, you look at music and you go, yeah, you can go on for a, a few years with guitar solos and in giant stadiums and, you know, uh, heavily produced music meant for FM consumption in car stereos. But then punk rock comes along. And how does it make its way? Well, it makes its way by hitting a different set of receptors in the brain. Um, and uh, I, I would hope that if a young person tries a newspaper, they might have that same visceral sensation you report and they might say, Hey, I want that again. That's different. Mm. You know, uh, I don't know if it tastes good or tastes bad, but it tastes different. And uh, I, I think that as, as long as human beings get sick of stuff and try new stuff, we're going to be okay. The fact is, though, that we're on an enforced diet at this point that we don't realize is enforced because we have had no alternative to it for a little while. Yeah, and it's so addictive. That's what's so so dangerous about it. I think is that it is it is a, it is appealing to all of the 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 stuff in your brain that wants more. You know, doom even doom scrolling sure. and. And I'm sure. guilty of this as much as I try to put guardrails around it. It's still you find yourself just shamefully doom scrolling and and, and and going, why did I just waste that time doing that? Oh, I, I mean, uh, you and I, I, I won't go into it further because I have a pledge in my heart to be discreet about it, share uh, um, a desire to get beyond addiction mm -hmm. based based in a personal history of, of recovery mm -hmm. let's put it that way okay so, so i'm with I, i'm i'm with you there um and uh i'm a little superstitious about talking about it because i always feel like tomorrow i might go over the edge yeah and and, and wish i hadn't i get it uh, <laughs> yeah oh yeah that 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 that, that self-proclaimed sober person i just saw <laughs> stumbling down the street um but i get uh, it but but anyway, uh, I, I like that we have a word for doom scrolling. I, I, uh, I think that that I think that's a step in the right direction. At least we know what we're doing, you know. Um, <laughs> toward the end of my drinking days, I was perfectly willing to tell anybody who talked to me that I was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. as though you know, as, as though consciousness of it made it better. But maybe it did in the end because I, you know, I did get sober. Um, and uh, maybe knowing that doom scrolling is exactly that is feeding some primitive appetite for alarm and anxiety as a, as a mental stimulant is, you know, a step toward being conscious of what exactly we're doing. Hmm. I hope so. I was reading a whole article and I wish I could find it because I, I didn't save it, but it was all about how our, our brains are literally being rewired from what, outrage was supposed to do so outrage was supposed to be this function that was rare but yes. got you moving <laughs> oh, actually I, 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 got you off the couch and moving and now it's just something that we do passively while we're on the couch we don't only do it passively we seek it out it's a destination experience right <laughs> uh, uh, um no I, I i there are days when i've been very busy, you know, driving around doing errands. Maybe I've had out, outside chores to do. And I get back and I say, you know, that little part of my brain that has that itch for, uh, um, you know, alarm, I haven't scratched it today. Mm. And then I quickly do. All I would have to do is say, well, I can do that tomorrow and then keep on putting it off and I might be okay. But uh, <laughs> it's a product. Um, uh, concern and outrage are products now. Mm. And I mean, I like to throw this word around sometimes. Uh, it's kind of satanic in a way, uh, or uh, devilish at least, on the part of um, the engineers of our info world to place rage on an equal uh, footing with maybe uh, beauty and attraction and other things. Because 
to them, it's all the same. Yeah. It gets them, it gets them into your nervous system. And all they want is to pour into your nervous system, no matter how it's done. Uh, yeah. You, I think if you listen to this podcast, mm-hmm. we at the, anyone who listens to it all the way through, I do a check-in with my producer at the end and we always joke because our check-in always ends with us talking about the apocalypse. We're like, well, we're talking about <laughs> some version of the apocalypse. So let's, uh, let's, let's end it up. Let's wrap it up. And I have to try and balance my dystopian apocalyptic fears with some form of optimism, especially being a, a geriatric mommy who had a child later in life that ruined all of my ability to just, you know, collapse into cynicism like I right, wanted sure. to. <laughs> I had a mother who was only, you know, about a generation and a half uh, removed from some Hungarian immigrant, really kind of peasant uh, grandparents. And she spent most of her time with her grandmother who'd come over here, spoke Hungarian and never really mastered English. And there is a kind of cultural preference among that group that my mom embodied for worrying and having apocalyptic uh, concerns. It predates the internet, you know, oh, everything's going to hell. Oh, if you do that, you you know, you you might go blind. Oh, if da, 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 da. And so I came to see that though my mom was basically happy she also had this apocalyptic streak. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, and, and I thought maybe human beings at some superstitious part, so in some superstitious core, think that entertaining terrible thoughts about catastrophe holds it off. Maybe. And maybe that's, and maybe that's what we're doing. I mean, even kids enjoy uh, dystopian novels. They love them. Mm-hmm. I mean, Hunger Games was a, was a, you know, young adult book. Yeah. Let's remember uh, a young adult hit. Yeah. And so I think there is something that maybe we should pardon ourselves for in, in being attracted to worst case scenarios. Mm, that's really interesting. I, I, that's an optimistic view of it. My friends laugh at me because my mantra is kind of, it can always get worse. And, and, <laughs> And I do, I think a lot, you know, I've interviewed my friend who's a Holocaust survivor on this show as well. And they just, it kept getting worse. People, it's like that. So I witnessed a shooting once. I'll never forget it because the most amazing thing about that moment, I was driving in LA and I was, it was broad daylight five o'clock in the afternoon. I was coming home from teaching yoga. So I was in a little bit of a Zen state and I was at a stop sign and looked to my left and looked to my right and saw two kids run out and thank God ran in the direction away from me. Otherwise I might not be even having this conversation with you. And then two other kids ran out. They were pretty young boys and it was like, bang, 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 bang. And I just kept driving because I was like, hmm. Immediately though, my brain started lying to me. Im- immediately. Immediately my brain is like, that that must have been kids with cap guns. I know what guns sound like. That must have been kids with cap guns. This is, it's broad daylight. We're in the middle of West Los Angeles and Santa Monica. It, it was immediate. And I came, I went home and I was like kicking rocks down my alley thinking about all of this. I'm like, I, you know, that gut instinct was like, I know that was a shooting I just saw. I know yeah. it. And I, my cousin ran into me in the alley and she's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, I think I just witnessed a shooting. And this is the kind of stuff that often happens around me. And she's like, God damn it, Bridget. And I was like, yeah, but wouldn't there be? And immediately as I had that thought, like it was Armageddon, you know, the the helicopters and the sirens and and I was like, yeah, that was an actual shooting. But this is this is that like human ability to deny what is happening. You know, we moved we moved to so part of me thinks maybe it is us trying to stave off like what's what's po- potentially coming, or is it just like a massive, as the kids these days would say, cope? 
it, are we just in kind of massive denial about what what is actually are we like frogs in boiling water and this was something that always struck me with talking to my friend from the holocaust they just they saw the signs and so many people had opportunities to get out and didn't take them that's just what's so mind boggling to me and i think probably your grandmother you know they're not that far removed around from things constantly getting worse even though it's like, don't worry. Well, I mean, let me reverse engineer my grandmother's experience as I can, uh, you know, as well as I can. She came from a part of the world, you know, Hungary, it was called then, it was Austro-Hungarian Empire. And before that, it was Carpathia and Transylvania and all these strange sort of principalities and kingdoms <laughs> in which, in, in, in which, the village was always getting burnt down by men who show up on horseback representing some new strong arm <sighs> regime. Um, they were, I, it, the, um, the legend in my family was that she was actually a gypsy, which is something she would have been ashamed of and not admitted when she got to America. Mm. Um, and, and if you're a gypsy, well, I mean, you, pretty much every two days, somebody is coming to, push you out into a new place you're right. getting back in the wagons you're living by your wits our experience uh, in 10 generation depth inside our souls almost no matter where we come from if our if our uh, forebears come from africa europe wherever is of some pretty intense shit yeah and uh, and and now but now trauma comes in the form of some momentary uh, outburst at a stoplight <laughs> that, that, that you are in a car and then go past and start to question whether it even happened. Uh -huh. At some level, however, that experience is activating, I would guess, this kind of Jungian background of just human uh, trauma processing. And even though on a conscious level, you may go, did that even happen? At a deep level, you have started a long-term and very deep process of acknowledging and um, and surviving a terrible thing, mm. even though it might not have looked from a movie perspective like like it was a terrible thing. It was like but Boys the in the Hood. You know, it was like yeah. a scene from, and I, I left out the part how I drove down the alley that they ran out of and looked to see which, and I, when I went to the next stop sign, two kids ran and they were kind of talking to each other quickly and they were communicating like, let's go to the bus. I overheard that. And then I turned to the, I turned down the alley and looked to see if anyone was hurt. I don't know what I was thinking. If it, I, I don't know. I just was like, someone must be hurt. And right. somebody was, but they were on the, um, like on the grass in between trees on the sidewalk. So I couldn't, I didn't see anyone. It just looked like everyone was gone. And then I was like, well, I guess I was hallucinating. So it, it, and then it ended up that somebody was shot and he was, he was just out of sight. And, and so, so it's time release terror for you because only slowly does it dawn on you. Or do you allow it to dawn on you that, that it could have been you? Um, that that that's how random the world is. Mm -hmm. That at any that that not at every stoplight, but at one stoplight in five thousand, death may lurk. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to go on and go home and fix dinner and you know put your child to bed and uh, get ready for the next day's podcast with that knowledge that terrible knowledge lurking somewhere in your skull. Yeah. So it, it, it isn't to bring it back to the, you know, original subject. It isn't that surprising that you would seek out maybe pessimistic or, or, or alarming or difficult subjects to read about as a way of aerating that very, you know, that, that very troubling deep, even terrifying moment that didn't come with terror at the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's so it's so interesting because my husband always jokes that he lacks my capacity for catastrophic thinking. <laughs> and I do wonder if it's more of a female thing because so many of the women I knew were like back in, you know, January, late January, February 2022 when I was going down the Chinese social media rabbit holes and I was like, this is coming. The world's going to change. You need to go get a gun. We need to make sure that we're... And my husband was like, you're crazy. Maybe 20 people are going to get sick, Bridget. And I'm like, there should... There... I was like, they're welding people in their houses. <laughs> and a lot of women, my mom forced her husband to get a generator. I mean, a lot of women were very like, hey, we need to get ready for this. And the men were like, "What? what's your problem? And I don't know if the men were, I don't know if that's like a, I wonder if it's a female thing that they lean more towards more <laughs> catastrophic thinking than men. Or do you think men engage in it in just maybe in the same way? Oh, well, I, you see, I live in, in small town, Montana, Montana. Oh, okay. I, I live in, a, <laughs> I live in a, I live in a fairly bohemian small town, uh, Livingston, you know, famous for a lot of writers and artists and even movie people who've lived nearby, even though it's an ordinary town, it's, it's still a working class place surrounded as, as we are these days by oligarchical, you know, mansions hidden away somewhere. Um, but in any case, uh, what tended to happen here was that the men, often with military experience, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's one of the things about, quote, middle America. A lot of the men have middle ex military experience. Yes. And, and, and so when they saw what was being brewed for us, um, the lineup at the generator store was long. Uh, though most people already had generators. So they were buying second generators. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, uh, a prepare, preparedness is a, you know, an actual hobby here yes. besides being a necessity because we do live in a place which is cut off from supply lines, you know. Yeah. What if the, you know, what if the trucks stop coming? You know, we're out here in the, wind whipped great plains in the middle of winter you, you better have stuff yeah um anybody who's ever driven in montana or lived here in the winter knows that preparedness is just common sense yeah no it, it was funny my wife and i our our sort of division of our division of concern during covid was a little different than what you report she she believed in contagion much more strongly than i did and she feared contagion much more strongly than I have. Um, I've got this cussed personality that since mm, boyhood, it, it goes toward anything I'm warned is dangerous to find out <laughs> if it's, to sort of find out if it's true. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, 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 um, I, uh, uh, and, and so at the very beginning of COVID, I'd been in Las Vegas and I'd been going for reasons I can't even explain to uh, <laughs> To big concerts, big pop concerts. And the day before Las Vegas closed down because of COVID, I, I'm at a Bruno Mars concert, of all things. I'm in the second row, right in the middle, with some high rollers who had gotten a package to go see Bruno Mars from the front row. And I'm looking up into the footlights as Bruno is dancing. And people are screaming so hard that the particles of spit from their mouths are forming a mist in the footlights of this giant stage. Oh, wow. At T-Mobile State. Yes. <laughs> so we already knew that COVID was coming, but we hadn't yet completely panicked. Uh -huh. And I went, I went, if I don't get sick tonight or tomorrow, I'm not going to. Okay. And so I, I left the concert, the, con the, the spit fog concert and went to a hotel, having called my wife and said, you know, I, I've not just been exposed probably to COVID. I, I, I've actually had a fire hose of it shoved down my lungs. So I'm going to hang at this hotel and see if I get sick before I come home. Well, I didn't. And then it was over for me. Then for two years, I had to sit around and watch people panic. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot happened in that time that was real life for me. My father died of, uh, 
Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, I'm sorry. In, in, yeah, well, uh, in any case, it all looked like a bit of a, a, a spectacle, a movie to me, COVID. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but my wife was initially of the belief that the mail might have COVID on it. Mm. You know, if Amazon dropped off a book, it might have COVID on it. You know, um, she changed rather quickly in her view. She, she realized that we had been sold a bill of goods. Mm. Uh, I, I, I mean, she had to let her grandmother die alone in a, 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 a you know, a locked down nursing home. That stuff makes me so outraged still. The blood oh. boil. Oh, I, I, it was one, it was one abomination after another. The fact that I, AA meetings were closed and liquor stores were open, it, like, I can't tell you how many friends, I, 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 I still feel like my temperature rise when I even think about how many people we lost and how it, it it's like, my brain goes into, I understand like blind rage. <laughs> As I say, I try to be, I try to be cagey about my participation in the recovery scene, but I do, you know, without, without being too detailed, people's lives are at stake when they can't walk into an AI, AA meeting. Yeah. People out in the alley, people who've just lost everything, people who are living in their car, people who've been thrown out by their spouse, people who, you know, uh, are reduced to real bottoms they're not walking around with an internet connection they got two places to go maybe yeah AA, jail or the emergency room yeah and uh, they don't want to go to jail and most of them don't want to go to the emergency room they're... so i just watched devastation yeah among those who among those who needed help uh, and i watched in this you know as i say i live in a little town yeah, and one of the one of the big problems here in this town was the schools, which really serve as not just social centers for kids, but for a lot of poor kids, it's a place where they get a good lunch. It's a place where people check on them. Uh, it, it, it's the safe zone, and they just shut it down. And uh, the, the the idea the idea that they were all supposed to revert to their uh, laptops. Uh, which they didn't own. I mean, I live in one of the poorest counties in Montana. Um, it's got some of the richest people in it, but you know, let's take the average. Yeah. I, 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 between that, between what, like what we talked about, essential services like uh, recovery meetings for addicts and alcoholics, um, and the whole suite of things that people do to survive, the response was, to me, a punishing crime, abominable, and you were meant to feel guilty when you pushed back on it. Yeah. Oh my God. I, I, I mean, it radicalized me in so many ways, Bridget. <laughs> and, and I, 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 I mean, and I already was that was of that mind, but to see the information operations against people who are getting hurt by this thing, against people who are questioning their response. And to see that they were orchestrated at the highest levels and carried out by the most privileged people sitting mm. in their, you know, sitting in their home offices in Northern California or their Google headquarters or their Twitter and Meta, you know, offices where, you know, their, their, their coffee drinks come on automated trolleys and they can go to the gym between uh, lunch and coming back to the desk while they waged devastating war on the middle and working classes of this yeah oh. yeah yeah i mean i was definitely i think i i've i came out and was like oh what's the, what's the big deal if we pause for two weeks while people on the right were like this is insane and i saw the what was going on in Italy and what was going on in China and it kind of terrified me I think I was probably more in line with your wife where I felt like it might be more like contagion my husband was much more measured and he was working at Trader Joe's at the time and he was like Bridget right. 
Like we, that's why we really never lost our minds because he was working at Trader Joe's and then he got a different job and was working in recovery. And those guys are all like living in houses to get, you know, he, we were never not exposed to people, the masses. So we didn't, we didn't, I didn't like suffer the same fate. So many people I knew who were of the, as you know, Carol Markowitz kind of describes them, the laptop class where they were allowed to really lock down and have their food delivered and not have to engage with people. And I pretty quickly after a couple of weeks realized that I had been, you know, it was like duped essentially and, and reverse course on what I was seeing in the same, in the same thing. in in Los Angeles, you know, when they're like, Oh, they go on like, I saw Bill Maher and other people were like, we're ready to open up, you know, like we're over it. I'm like, you do know people never locked down, right? Like there was a whole working class group of people that didn't ever stay home. They were working through the whole pandemic. It seems like people weren't aware of that. And I was um, radicalized. In many ways, even, and I said this, I was like, the school thing was outrageous. I'm like, who do you think is going to be hurt the most by them shutting down these playgrounds? It's not the kids who have palatial backyards and tutors and iPads. These, these kids are already, they talked about, you know, that summer gap that these kids suffered who, and it's like now they're on a two year extended summer, summer gap. It just... Yeah, I, w- I was definitely radicalized. You remember how people started wearing PJs to the airport a yeah. few years ago? Okay. So way I instantly read this whole thing was that they were going to give America a P- two-week PJ party. Right. Um, and that, And I knew it wouldn't end. I knew the PJ party was the bait. Oh, well, everybody gets everybody gets two weeks vacation in America and you can feel good about it because you're doing your civic duties, stopping the spread. And, you know, my kids were sent home from college uh, from their very uh, expensive private colleges back east, which I also thought was stupid. I was like, wait a sec. There's this terrible virus and uh, you're, you're off at college where you are likely to if you're any. If you're anyone in America who goes to school, you're more likely to be catching a virus. Okay. Yeah. Anybody who has anybody has kids knows that. Yeah. You get sick because your kids bring it home from school. Yeah. So now they're bringing all the kids in America home from school through the transportation <laughs> system, um, you know, passing through the airports of America and so on. And that's a and that's an anti-contagion measure. I, I was like. This whole thing is bullshit. Yeah. I, I, I knew it instantly. I talk about, you know, having a Hungarian great grandmother from the misty <laughs> Carpathian mountains, <laughs> maybe who lived as a gypsy. Every every bit of peasant wisdom in my body told me I was being had. And, <laughs> you know, um, they probably they probably use this one on the gypsies for thousands of years. You know, oh, there's a terrible disease going around. Get on your horses and get out of town, you know, mm. um, or or we're going to surround you with horses and kill all of you now yeah. because you've ma- you're making us sick. Not being able even to vent that uh, point of view in the mildest way without getting some kind of attack label put on me. And then having to show, having to show visually my um, orthodox uh, consent to all this bullshit with a mask, that I, I couldn't do. And I'll be honest with you, I was really willing to get into fights with people about it. And, <laughs> And, and I don't think my kids wanted to be around me. Other people did because because anytime I went to the supermarket, I I, I would have the mask because I needed food, but I'd rip it off the minute they you know the minute I paid for it. When I, I the minute I was getting away with my loot, then I started to see the the even more frightening effect, which was the social pressure mm-hmm. as people as suddenly I found myself 
with my peasant wisdom <laughs> in a terrible <laughs> minority. And I was like, they're going to come after me. You know, mm -hmm. uh, now I have to stay inside because I'm an enemy of the state, not right. because I'm afraid of contagion. Right, right. It's so, I think about all of the, I love the idea of peasant wisdom because I, I always joke that I'm like when people are like, I was a king in a past life. I'm like, I was a starving peasant in every past life I've ever had. There's no doubt in my mind. I have such food anxiety and water anxiety just naturally. Like <laughs> I'm Irish, you know, I'm like, I, th my genes are like mm, food. I'm every meal. I'm like, thank God for this. And every Every I'm always have to have a bottle of water and the water thing is I'm constantly focusing on and freaking out about and don't feel like we can really outrun that problem. And because they're just stockpiling it. But the idea of this like peasant wisdom kicking in and and how many ways you had to show your allegiance like the black square, the pronouns, the mask, there are all these new signifiers that you have to to put up in order to be like I'm with the approved narrative and it it something was sticking out to me when you were talking about your kids being brought home from college I had I interviewed Paula Scanlon and we were talking about her experience with Leah Thomas she's one of the collegiate swimmers who came out and testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee about her experience being with Leah Thomas in the locker room. Now, whatever your feelings about that are is irrelevant. What was really interesting that stuck out to me that she was talking about was there was all this talk about how Leah Thomas might be allowed on the team and people kept waiting for the adults in the room to be like, that's not like this is ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Look at you can't. This isn't going to happen. And Leah was supposed to graduate, but took a gap year. So they thought everything shut down and they thought Leah was just going to graduate. It wouldn't be an issue. Leah took a gap year. They all came back and the school and then she was on the team. But Paula was saying we were just so grateful to be back swimming because they'd lost a full year that they didn't even have it in them to uh, to fight the fight. And everybody was like, you should be grateful. They told them they should be grateful they didn't have to wear their masks while they were swimming. <laughs> while they were swimming. I kid you not. This is... That's and just an attempt to break the human mind. That's what I mean, though. I think so many... This is a piece that I've been trying to write all of our brains are broken and we I'm not sure that we realize it. You know, I'll go online. Not, my, not mine, baby. Yours is not. not. Mine. Yours I, is not. I did not let them break it. I saw I, I saw them coming. But the, <laughs> the gypsy in me knew the king's soldiers were just put, over the hill. I could smell their of. breath at a mile away. Uh, and I remember watching them close the beach, go the out beach. and grab some poor surfer yeah. off the freaking beach in California. And I went, Anybody who can see this and then still take this damn thing seriously has made a choice. They're not just stupid. They're not just brainwashed. I don't believe in brainwashing, by the way. I, I, I know a lot about hypnosis and hypnosis is the willing is, is the willing submission to an authority figure. After you agree to be hypnotized, maybe what happens next isn't completely within your power. But the notion that we get into this brainwash state where we do everything reflexively, uh, that doesn't wash with me. You, there is always a choice to stop submitting at any point in the hypnosis process. You can get up and say, this is bullshit yeah. and walk, you know, and walk off the stage if it happens to be that kind of hypnosis. And when I, when I saw people going back into the trance after these trance breaking absurdities, like arresting somebody on a beach, I went, they want to be in it. They mm. like it. They like it. It's comfortable. It's the PJs. It's the PJs way of being. Here I am in the middle of the herd, in my PJs, in my soft chair, in front of my computer, with my phone. I got my music playing. I could live this way. And whatever edicts that they, uh, 
whatever edicts that they use to make this world possible and excusable, I'm going to stay in it because yeah. it's, com it's I, comfortable. You're describing something that it, you know, there were so many images that really stuck out. But when they shut everything down in that in those early days, it was kind of rainy in Los Angeles. And my husband and I took a walk and no one was out. No one. It was eerie. It's Los Angeles down in the beach in Santa Monica and not a single person was walking. And I don't even know if you were, I think it was before they put us under curfew when we were under lockdown, which was like a, another insane thing. And we walked past this guy, this apartment. And I remember seeing a guy in his PJs. I remember the PJs. He was wearing these flannels. And he had a, you know, craft beer next to him and he was on his laptop in front of the TV and um, and had his phone. So he had his laptop and his phone and his TV. And I remember he had this nice little blankie and I was like, wow, this is our this is like a, a faux apocalypse, you know, it was like a. I, I kept calling it a I kept calling oh. it a um pandemic light. You know, I'm like, this is this is the like emergency we're in. This is just people hanging out, drinking beer and and surfing the internet. <laughs> it was a freaking live action role playing. <laughs> we're in a pandemic exercise in which people who didn't feel important otherwise got to feel important because there were all these new roles you could play. You could be the person in your family who's spraying everything down and not allowing grandma and grandpa to come over because they watch Fox News. Right. So you could be the ideological enforcer. You could be the super, super sick person who secretly knew maybe they were getting over it, but didn't want to go back to work. Um, you, you could be the person who, um, uh, like me, in fact, who, who, who said, hey, man, uh, look, they're taking away your humanity. They're thrusting these absurd restrictions on you. They, they are keeping the drunk from getting sober, the, 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 the child from seeing the dying parent, uh, the person with a spiritual crisis from going to church. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the town crier to some extent. <laughs> The crazy peasant. And, was, and, and, and you see, the worst thing about everything is that even the virtue roles are kind of contemptible. Like, I, you know, I, I didn't even want to be playing that one. I, I just wanted to say, no, stop playing. Yeah. Stop playing. And Walter, you stop playing too. Yeah. Because this, this ends the minute you snap your fingers. Are you from Montana? Where are you from? I'm from Minnesota. Um, oh. Some claim to be able to hear it when I speak. I, I came from a town of about 500 people. Um, and then my family moved for a year to the megalopolis of, megalopolis of Phoenix, Arizona, and then back to an even smaller town where I lived on a farm. And, and I had a weird upbringing. My dad was a patent attorney for a corporation, the 3M Corporation, that makes scotch tape, et cetera. And... But we lived far out in the country on a farm that we worked with horses and Amish implements. So talk about schizophrenic. I mean, I'm, the cultural uh, ambivalence of my father is, is built into me, too. Mm. Um, he was a guy who went to a corporate job, in other words, and then got home, stripped down to his long underwear and went and shot a squirrel and make his family eat it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> literally yeah that's that's interesting i graduated from high school in orno so minnesota minnesota has a, a a place in my heart i'm like part minnesotan my family's from new england but we moved a lot growing up and that's why i was saying it's nice it's weirdly nice even though texas is its own thing entirely with its own magic right. and its own vibe and its own blood in the soil that I need to tap into. And I'm fascinated by the like Texas thing. Um, it feels good to be back in the middle of the country at this moment in America. And it's something that I respect so much in you and turn to you for is we are in a very fascinating, strange time of migration in this country actual migration, ideological migration, 
all kinds of migrating Psycholo- happening. Psychological migration. Psychological yeah. migration. And I think I feel more comfortable being at the crossroads than I did. I mean, I had to get out of California. That that state was is is just I a lost a lost cause, which is tragic because it's so beautiful. But which okay, nobody loves California and the mythos of California more than a kid who grew up on a fricking farm eating squirrels in Minnesota. Yeah. So, so I've lived as, as an adult for long periods in California. My wife uh, was in Los Angeles when I met her and I rather didn't do long distance courtship. I kind of moved down there. Okay. And uh, I lived on the beach in Malibu, man. Uh, And (laughs) it was actually, it was actually possible for a guy who works for a living in 2009 yeah. 10 11 12 to get a you know not cheap apartment but an apartment that if you're willing to dig deep a little you could live on the damn beach yeah and that that was all my dream you know um and so i relate to this so I, much I, and, and i've been there but i lost so much respect for california during COVID. i can't even tell you yeah man they, they turned over surfing to the man yeah what yeah uh you know surfing the outlaw religion of the seas yeah gets turned over to the freaking bureaucrats because it's supposedly and in no way even conceivably contributes to this virus thing come on this is just punishment we're in the fucking dungeon now this yeah. is the dominatrix going you know nope you can't smoke <laughs> nope you can't move you know uh, yeah. uh people had to like it to go to the lengths they did yeah and they and, and the big secret of covid that it was that it was a masochistic orgy for the pj people yeah. you know um and uh but it wasn't a joke for the drunk. It wasn't a drunk for the nine-year-old whose parents are screaming and drunk all the time at home yeah. and only gets respite at school. It was not a joke for the owners of these small shops in Livingston, Montana, who for a while had to close while everybody goes with their big fucking vans over to Costco yeah. and load and loads up like a, you know, a, a kind of philosophically obese person uh, <laughs> on, on six months supplies of chips. Um, I love you so much. Oh. We really are more kindred spirits than I, I ever could have imagined. Now that I've talked to you, now I know I have been such a, <laughs> such a huge fan of your work. <laughs> I got, I mean, the toilet paper thing was madness to me. My husband and I would laugh because he, he was working at a, at a store and they had to like hide the toilet paper. <laughs> He's like, what? Uh, Bridget, these- that, Bridget, I'm going to tell you what. The toilet paper op was a way to divide the genders. Because <laughs> let's just get real. Women need more toilet paper than men yes. do. Yes. The fact is that men don't even really need toilet paper, sadly, <laughs> at all. They'll, it's a convenience. It's nice and everything. But we don't need it. Women need it. And yeah. they need a lot of it. And they need the soft kind. And, uh, and and so when there was a toilet paper shortage, you immediately had this like gender division where it's like, you know, honey, we already have 70 rolls. Yeah, but don't you realize the rate that we go through it? No, I've never thought about it before. Um, now I'm seeing it and I'm frankly appalled. You know, <laughs> we're, gonna we're, going a, we're going through a forest a month in this house and I, just to stay even, um, you know. New ho- now we're going to have to build houses with a toilet paper room in them because the damn thing, it fills up your entire car and you only bought $50 worth of it. It's you know, so um, wild. It was, I, I just, I want people to, I please do a piece in your County line documenting all of this madness, all because people are going to forget. They're already oh, forgetting. Oh, I, I, I won't let them. I won't let them, Bridget. Uh, you know, it came at just the right time for me when, uh, in life where uh, I had my eyes wide open. I had grown up enough to be alert to the absurdities of our uh, system, of our corporate and governmental, which I call GovCorp uh, regime. Mm-hmm. And I remember the night I, was, I turned on TV. See, I don't watch TV. 
Uh, but, you know, they had us watching the news and I kind of watched the news to find out, you know, what sort of insanity was being visited on the people who did watch it. Right. And it wasn't the news that night that got me. It was a commercial for, I don't know if it was for Scott toilet paper or Charmin or something. <laughs> And it showed trucks from sort of like high drone <laughs> angles going down long highways through the Great Plains at night to deliver the toilet paper. Sort of like the way that we used to talk about the U.S. postman, you know, neither sleet nor hail yep. nor dark of night will stop them from their appointed rounds. Well, now they were heroizing the Charmin delivery <laughs> trucks or something. And I just went, wow, like... Are the screenwriters, is the writer's room, because having worked in Hollywood writer's rooms, I, I couldn't help but imagine that there was like a writer's room under some like air base in on the East Coast, like <laughs> where they were doing, you know, COVID narrative central. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I could just see a guy sitting down like, hey, man, I got one. Let's make heroes out of toilet paper delivery trucks. It's so true. Like, Yes, that will break their minds even further. That's a real that's a reality melting thing and and we won't allow them to laugh at it either, okay? And if anybody laughs at it, we'll, we'll punish them. And if they tweet about it, we'll punish them. This is going to change everything. Let's see if it works. Now I know why my show Dumpster Fire on YouTube is so throttled. I mean, it, it all we do is make fun of this stuff. It's just we we, did you see the one this week, the latest, like, mind-breaking, we live in, absolutely live in a simulation with Djokovic? You know, they they finally let him into the country to compete, and he won, and the shot of the day was sponsored by Moderna, the, like, image of him winning. I was like... But, but let's, get, let's get serious for a second. Uh, I, 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 think that, I think calling it a simulation is a cop-out. Uh, that that's a way of denying responsibility to the people who actually are responsible. Yeah. And, it's an, and also, it's also a way when you see ironic things like that of ignoring the way that irony is um, deliberately used to uh, keep people uh, at bay and submissive. Mm. In other words, when things are ridiculous, when they don't add up, when, you know, suddenly today you're being told something that you were set that, that was said to be um, for, forbidden yesterday when the authorities are contradicting themselves, when uh, just ridiculous absurdities of uh, hypocrisy are being exposed. It's not the simulation. It's the establishment, which is telling you even all your sense-making faculties all your desire to be consistent, all your ability to point out and see hypocrisy, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You're friggin', you're friggin powerless. Don't yeah. you get it? Don't you get uh, it yet? Walter, it's so- We want you to laugh at us because tomorrow we'll issue an order that you'll still take. Mm. Even though you saw swimmers, even though you saw swimmers <laughs> and surfers get taken off the beach, even though, you know, uh, you were told that, oh, if you have the right protest motives, you can't get COVID. Yeah. Uh, or spread it or whatever. We want the world to seem ridiculous to you because that's the final process of demoralization. When you go, it doesn't make any sense. I'm going to give up trying to make it make sense. I'm going to give up even doom scrolling or laughing at it. I'm just going to lie down, close my eyes, <laughs> go into the deep PJ trance in which they put the headphones on me and I go into Mark Zuckerberg meta world and I just float around in some disney bullshit heaven while they cut pieces of my body off. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm I glad I'm still laughing at it. It's funny, the word that we, so my last name is a word I made up and I made it up years ago to try and and articulate something that I couldn't articulate. And it was this, the only way I could describe it was irony squared. And it was when 
irony kind of doubled back on itself and became literal. Now, no one understood this, obviously. And now everybody, and so I said, it's like be basically when reality becomes parody or parody becomes reality, everyone understands it now because we live in the the age of the, the fetishy. Now it's like everywhere you turn, you see people saying beyond parody. And that was what this word that I basically made up was trying to define but now I see that it's um, really just a, an insidious way of demoralizing everyone. <laughs> it, 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 what, what's, let me take down a notch here and be a little bit more um, logical and, and uh, meticulous in my presentation. If you're in an abusive relationship, one of the techniques that the abuser uses is inconsistency. Mm. Okay. They tell you that you're getting fat, okay? And you, you, you better not eat uh, that piece of cake. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I don't think you should, um, you know, have alcohol anymore. I don't think that you should um, do anything that, that risks uh, raising your weight. And then three days later, they came home, they come home with a giant birthday cake and say, let's eat, it's my birthday. And you go, well, I, I'm not even allowed to, you know, have toast, dry toast. Uh, you just, I'm supposed to eat cake for your birthday? Yes. And I want you to eat a big slice. Oh, God. And after a while, yep. you don't have a will anymore. Because you can't anticipate what's going to be said the next day. You just wait for it to happen. And you roll and that's what's being done. Yeah. And calling it a and calling it a simulation is a big cop out because, you know, if it's a simulation at some deep, you know, uh, metaphysical level that we're living in, perhaps. But these social experiments aren't the simulation. They're being run. They've been researched. What do you think they do in social psychology labs and universities across this country? What do you think they do in intelligence? intelligence agencies uh, as they hire different psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, and so on to figure out what makes humans tick. They've been at this experimental research for a hundred years. So and now they've got a and now they've got a target population that's uh, you know ready to be have it be used on, and they've got a vector of delivering it through social media. So it is an orgy of abusive systematic mind fog. you need to go on rogan uh, I, I i listen man i i i i would love to go on rogan you I need to go this. i'm gonna advocate for this he you guys <laughs> would have such a good time together he would love you just absolutely love you so what do you do what how do you how do you how does the average person in this kind of situation what do you what do you recommend? <laughs> or is this a you know, piece you need to write? Well, let's move back a step. Bridget, do you have all new friends in the last five years? Because I do. <laughs> You're my newest. <laughs> well, well, what yeah, I, I, what I, I What I mean, what, what I mean by that is now you you live in Austin, right? Yeah. You went from well, so, ish. so that cha yeah that changed your social life. Mm. As you voiced opinions that are even a, you know, a, a sh shadow of the ones I've just voiced, certain people went away, right? Many. I mean, Many. certain other people went like, hey, I secretly agree with you. Can we yeah. be friends? So my world has turned upside down in the greatest way mm -hmm. because I came out of some Ivy League meritocratic, uh, you know, mid 20th century pipeline of people who went to New York and came up through magazines and, you know, uh, thought it was all a game of advancement and uh, fitting in and mm. getting a nicer apartment and, you know, upgrading your tastes every five years as your income rose. That all just went to hell. Okay. Suddenly I only could be friends with people who lived in reality. Right. I just couldn't be, I couldn't be part of that anymore. It had been coming for a long time and it actually changed even before COVID. So now I have all these new friends 
and uh, make much less money and <laughs> am accepted in fewer and fewer places that I didn't like being in any way when I think back on it. Um, I don't have to bullshit with people and be friends with them just because we all are educated or whatever. Mm -hmm. I actually get to stick with the people who I respect, admire, who have some courage, who are funny, who live life according to what's happening inside their head, not what they're being programmed to do. And it's actually really preferable. Yeah. I, I mean, I've got to say, I've met more interesting people, gotten involved with more interesting projects. He, I, I do this podcast with Matt Taibbi. I, I'm not speaking out of school here. Matt would Matt, Matt believes in the truth. I didn't know Matt. I, I, I you know, he was a, a journalist who I admired, who I loved. Yeah. The reason we, the reason we came together is that we do have one crossover, which is that we're civil rights and free speech nuts. Yeah. Who, who will not see that barrier crossed without us standing and fighting. And it put me together with a journalist who I would never even met otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that the county line is going to do things, too, that are just so highway. Good. County I mean, highway. sorry, county highway. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about a county line. Um, the county highway is going to it's it's just so necessary. I love how long the articles are. It takes discipline. You know, I'm, I I realize just how fried my brain is when I sit down and read a long <laughs> newspaper article. <laughs> just so shot. Uh, well, listen, people forget because newspapers, unless it's the New York Times or, you know, the Washington Post or the LA Times, newspapers have gotten pretty light. You know, mm -hmm. they, um, uh, they forget how many words can be crammed into a newspaper. Yeah. Uh, that that county highway only comes out six months or six times a year, every two months. But if you sit down and really want to read it, it's going to take you a good week. Yeah. I've been slowly making my way through it like a nice, fine. It's like a treat. What what's the average length of words for the articles in there? I have no idea, man. Uh, I, I, the layout of a newspaper is a lost art. And uh, David and I have people do it who are experts. Mm, and it's so it's well like done. putting together. It's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. I, I turn the pages and I go like, wow, like it fits. Yeah. Uh, how did we get it all to fit? You know, there's different ways of fudging space in a newspaper. You can, you know, put in little tiny bits, I guess. And, uh, adjust the type in mysterious ways. It's really a kind of lost art. It's like building pyramids. Or yeah. Something, you know. <laughs> I I could talk to you for hours. I wanted to ask just a few of the questions. If you, how much do you have time? I want to just be sensitive yeah, I, of your I time. Do, but I, I got to tell you, I'm getting terrible interference from your end. Oh, really? Um, the satellite must away. have been right overhead. <laughs> <laughs> You know that in, in, in 19 in 1984, they all have these telescreens in their in their houses in their apartments that look back at them, but they're never sure when they're turned on. And there's kind of a rumor that maybe they never work, maybe it never happens, maybe you're never watched, or sometimes. But as soon as they've introduced the suspicion, as soon as they've introduced the possibility, your mind they, they turn your mind against itself. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid to talk now. See, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm big on I'm big on laying the blame on actual people, mm -hmm. not the system, mm -hmm. not the you know, not the simulation, not uh, astrology, uh, not cycles in history, but actual assholes <laughs> who are sitting in rooms making decisions because I happen to know that's how it works. Mm. I've been around the people. I know who they, I know who they are. I know their names in many cases. Mm -hmm. And like, this is a new way of running a country. This is a new way of running a society. Uh, it's a, it's a, a age old fantasy that you can plan reality from the top and make it suit you. But technology has fallen uh, short of fulfilling that promise. Uh, you know, when they first got, when they first got, uh, the gun or 
whatever new weapon system, they could use it to intimidate people. And turning this internet into a weapon system for social control is absolutely predictable. We knew it would be tried. We just didn't know how we'd respond. I'm not sure what, what kind of grade we get for our response to it. The people who think it's not happening get an F. Yeah. Because they have, they have no imagination. Oh, wait, you think that the biggest powers in the world, the richest, uh, most militarized country in human history, which spends half of its zillion dollar budget on, you know, uh, basically weaponry or research that goes into it, hasn't figured out how to get its way using this technology? Right. Or it, it, it isn't trying? Then, then you're too stupid to live. <laughs> you don't. The, the, whatever the pe, whatever the peasant gene that my that my great that my grand, great grandmother gave to me in spades, you don't have even one shred of mm -hmm. anymore. It's true. I could walk. I could walk up to you, say, "Open your mouth, reach in, and pull out your gold fillings." <laughs> And just say, don't bite down because biting down is, is mean. Like a classic gypsy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you some of the questions just that my audience had for you that loves you. Um, one of the common questions actually was, what is the book you most wish could be in every high school curriculum that isn't? Well, I think high school is about talking and conversation, so a book should start a conversation. Um, and I think maybe the good old standards, like uh, you know Fahrenheit 451, mm -hmm. because it's kind of a ridiculous thing to imagine that they would burn books and that people would stand around cheering and that firemen would be hired to do it. And everybody can feel good about our society because we don't live in one where firemen are burning books outside. But as soon as you think about it for five more seconds, you realize, in fact, we do. But it's a much less colorful, less dramatic form of book burning that goes on. And then you realize that it's kind of ridiculous as that read that, read that book that the wife lives in a, she literally lives inside a television. She, the, the room uh, that she spends most time in has walls that project shows and she has nothing to talk about but those shows. And even though it's kind of a, a slightly misogynistic uh, 1950s portrait of a, 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 of a idiot housewife that I think doesn't quite fit the times, the idea of living inside a room that's a TV couldn't be more apt. And so I'm back to the basics as far as high school students. So I'm yeah. not going to recommend anything too esoteric. Just anything that gets them talking about this control world that they're not only expected to live in, but they're expected to make a living supporting. Yeah. They're yeah. expected to go out and start and start writing the programs that make it that make it possible. Yeah, this is another one of the common questions was people were saying they, they would love to see you expound on the parallels that they see between so many dystopian novels and, and the current situation. Well, you see between the dystopian, but I think we kind of did in this podcast. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to ask you my final two questions. What's your biggest defect yeah. of character? I think my biggest defect of character is laziness. I'm a little bit lazy. I, 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 when I feel like I'm making progress with something, I don't always drive to the end. When I have a kind of early superficial understanding of something, I take it and run with it rather than going deeper. Um, I, I think that I'm a guy who has a kind of love of sensation, uh, a, a, a love of um, strong effects, but I'm not someone who always finishes things and they call that ADD now or ADHD um, and I definitely have it but I don't know that it's a it's a it's a um, defective character as much as kind of a, a defective processing mm -hmm. uh, 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 processing habits in terms of character I'll be honest with you man I I I I I, I, I was for a long time 
person who was high and drunk did his work, did a lot of work, even found ways to combine the two in uh, ingenious ways, you know, <laughs> Adderall. Um, I had young kids, a family, uh, a big workload. I worked in sort of periodical journalism for Time Magazine, places like that. And I stayed pepped up, baby. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, because earning meant typing. Yeah. And typing isn't natural. And so I came through that period. And I think we both know that to get through that stuff, you have to take a hard look at yourself. Yeah. And, um, and I think the character defect that I discovered in doing that was that I was a cheater. You know, I was a guy who, it goes with what I just said a little bit. It, I tried sometimes to take the easy way and not get caught because I'd overloaded my life. Mm -hmm. I put too much. I, I wanted too much. I demanded too much. Uh, and if I had to cheat a little bit to get it in the sense of take pills rather than get rest, mm -hmm. um, and I, I sometimes did it. I'm not, now, I don't know if I was worse or better. You know, all, all of us who are in recovery wonder, where do we fall on the scale? You know, uh, how, how bad are we compared to the others? And sometimes I tell my story and people go, Dude, why, why are you even doing this? You were fine. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you made a big deal out of nothing. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I've been, in, you know, I just got out of 25 years in jail. Um, uh, you lightweight. Yeah. Um, but for me, it bothered me enough to, to, to think that I do, I do have amends to make. And, I'm, and I, do have I, I do have changes that I have to in institute. And so, you know, I don't know if anybody else looking at me from the outside who knows me well would say that those are my, my defects of character. I, I'm a little hasty, too, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, recovery tells you to slow down. Um, take a look at things. Don't react. Uh, don't, don't just do something, sit there is one of the slogans. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> but I want to do something. Yeah. And I'm a hothead. Yeah. And I like the chemicals and the excitement that comes from being a hothead sometimes. Yeah. I actually think I've made progress, though. I do. I yeah. Do. Not, that it, not that this show would be any evidence of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This show is, tends to bring out the, you know, the, like, I love this show because everybody really just gets real on it. And it's more just a conversation between friends. You know, I, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't worry about it. I think. I think my audience. I know most of them already love you, and those who don't know you will love you. Um, what is your biggest asset? Diane Nation energy. Hmm. I have a little nuclear reactor down in my gut that's been running since I've been conscious, and no matter how tired I get or how cynical I get or how disappointed I am. There's something that just says, go, man, go. You've only got so much time. You know, and I've lost my both my parents. Uh, my, my mom, young, uh, when she was younger, not when I was young, she was only 70, but man, she was she was headed for 100. Yeah. But something happened. And, uh, and my father from a very, I mean, they talk about diseases being cruel and who knows what the cruel rating is on disease, but ALS has to be right up there. I mean, uh, to, to lose every single nervous uh, circuit in your body, one by one, knowing that it can't be stopped, knowing that it will go until you literally have to blink to communicate and then you won't be able to blink. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to stop it, and you're trapped. That, watching my father, who's a big football player and a guy who loved to hunt and fish and run around and flirt with women and so on, have it taken away inch by inch in this pitiless way 
made me so grateful that I can sit upright in a chair and mm -hmm. talk to you that I can't tell you. So my greatest asset is simple gratitude for vitality and some vitality to match. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, I really just love you and respect so much your voice in this crazy, crazy time in America. I just, I wish, I wish we had our own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, anytime when you offend, when you, when you offend everybody else and you're down on your heels and they've canceled Bridget and no one wants to come to her on her show because she's so radioactive, I'll be there. Okay, thank you. I, 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 I don't know. I feel like I, I, it's weird. I feel like I kind of, I, I feel like they, the people who might cancel me realize the best thing to do is just ignore me. And I don't know that that's great for, you know, getting canceled kind of raises your profile and whatnot, but uh, I still get to just put out like pieces like I put out yesterday and they get spread around among the normies who are the people that I know and love. And, you know, I'm not, it's weird being in this media landscape and not being rich. Like most of the people I wrote this, piece recently about how real America is the middle seat and coach because most of the people who are kind of starting these culture wars and fanning them are like private jet flying <laughs> like rich people you know like they're I don't know that they I relate to them any more than I relate I don't know I I do feel like uh if my stuff gets ignored by those people and spread amongst normies, then I'm probably in the right place. I'm probably doing the right thing. So I don't know that I'll be canceled. I think all the media elites have decided it's best to just ignore me. I'm kind of disappointed in myself for even using the word canceled because it, it, it's, a, it's a vocabulary that I think... Um, died really in any meaningful way about two years ago. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you just migrate. You move to different squares on the board. Um, but, but the idea of canceled suggests that there's some big mainstream culture that we all need to aspire to be a part of. And when, you, and when it no longer accepts you, it's some terrible fate. Yeah. Uh, no, it isn't. It's, it's just like getting a new girlfriend uh, or <laughs> a new freedom. boyfriend. Uh, you know, uh, they didn't like you, but but no, I don't I don't acknowledge that there is any culture that has the status in America that it has the right to cancel people. Yeah. In other in other words, like uh, th that that implies that there's some authority mm -hmm. that does it, and I don't recognize that authority. I don't mm. think it exists anymore. Uh, it's the Wizard of Oz. We already mm. saw behind the curtain, okay? Anybody who's pretending that it's not just some little scared dude running a, you know, running a smoke and mirrors show, uh, they can think that if they want, if it makes them feel comfortable, like there's some uh, power at the top that makes life make sense. But the rest of us have seen through it, uh, and you know, Toto's already pulled back the curtain. We don't have to go along with that charade. I love that. Where can we find you and where can we subscribe to County Highway? Well, one of the reasons I'm underknown as you introduce me uh, is because I don't do a very good job of being findable or, of, you know, um, productizing myself. But I'm on Twitter, which is pretty much the only social media I use under my name, Walter Kern. Uh, County Highway is countyhighway.com and you know, you do have to subscribe or buy it in a store to get it. We don't put uh, uh, tidbits up on the internet. It does have a Twitter account, though. Yep. County H W Y. The last word's abbreviated, and you can subscribe through there. But you can find it with a basic internet search, and then you can sit around your house waiting for it to come in the mailbox, and then it won't come, and you'll complain to me on Twitter, which happens every day, where is my county highway? And I'm like, am I your mailman? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but we're using the U.S. mail here, and uh, maybe you should inquire with them. Um, uh, but, but 
then one day when just when you said man i got ripped off where is this damn thing it was just another scam to get me to pay up front it will appear in your mailbox that's so funny that people so, get mad i i i've subscribed and then i just patiently waited for it to appear i had total faith that it would appear well listen the speed of the u.s mail is not <laughs> something anybody likes to deal with anymore uh, listen, when you order a book, let's do a test here, Bridget. When you order a book or, so, or some like supplement or some internet thing, and they give you the three, uh, they give you the three uh, options for how it's going to be delivered, you know, that goes from like next day to, you know, today mm -hmm. to, to standard, okay? Nobody wants standard anymore. No. Like, how, of, how often do you pay? How often do you even go? Damn it! I don't do this that much. I want the overnight, yeah. you know, because that's me. So I can relate. I can relate to the impatient people, but it's like that's just one of the novel experiences that County Highway brings your way, <laughs> which is being like me when I was a kid, and I and I would I would subscribe to these like, or I'd send away for these classified things like X-ray specs that allegedly would allow me to see through women's clothes when I was you know, nine years old. <laughs> and then you'd wait forever. It was like a Christmas story. You'd wait forever. And then this weird box would come like seven weeks later <laughs> after, after you'd put your five bucks in an envelope. And it would be this completely disappointing novelty thing, uh, you know, manufactured to the lowest standards that would break. Except County Highway won't disappoint you. No. That's the problem. No, everyone should support this endeavor. I I can't wait for my next I um my next what is it? Edition? What is it called? What is it? Next issue, yeah. Issue. Okay. Well, I can tell I can preview now that for your audience alone that in the next issue I did a big story set in Colorado about aliens. Oh. It's worth reading. I think it's all worth reading on, in this. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you, and sorry for the technical difficulties. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Hello. 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 We're in the darkest timeline. It is a dark timeline. <clears throat> yeah, I felt like we were, almost didn't do a check-in because I'm traveling. Maggie has some health been, stuff been down like he's been down for the count and i just felt would have felt weird if i didn't acknowledge what was going on or what what happened in israel on october 7th when they were invaded by hamas and i think the body the death count Ugh. is up to like 1200 now and of course it spills over into war and civilians die everywhere pretty much every jewish man has been called up that is available wow. and even those who are not of the age have shown up and uh i haven't been able to sleep it's like i'm not even jewish and it's been so upsetting to me i cannot i can't sleep i'm I can I just can't even imagine. I also realized when this happened, most of my friends are Jewish. Yeah. Like actually the majority yeah. of my especially my female friends. Yeah. All my best female friends are Jewish. And so I it's that very strange thing of like not wanting to bombard them because I know they're actually I know for a fact like their Facebooks look like post 9-11 right. and it's missing or dead or kidnapped people and it's like different than anything too it's so the the modern psychological warfare that terrorists have access to and can use how so many of us were just online watching this live. Yeah. Seeing all, they, they were streaming it, uploading people's grandmothers that they killed to their Facebook, like the most horrific, diabolical, evil shit I've ever heard in my life. B the babies and kids. Ugh. Yeah. It's just, and then, 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 
then in the wake of it, you know, the Israel-Palestine thing is never something I've ever waded into because it is this topic that's fraught with history and I am smart enough to know when I don't know shit, as Mm -hmm. in Ukraine as well. It's like I can see, I can comment on what I'm seeing, but there's also historical precedent for anti-Semitism. And one of the primary things that has driven me out of the left has been the anti-Semitism on the left Mm -hmm. that I've seen. And I see have, when we talked to Jacob on this podcast in what, 2018, he was talking exactly about this, about Jacob as a Holocaust survivor. And he was talking about how he was starting to see it rampant on campuses when he would go and speak yeah and now you're seeing these campuses put out these like harvard all these wishy-washy statements that are just borderline victim blaming israel it it is on the heels of something unprecedented the most number of jews who have been killed in one day since the holocaust yeah and everyone's like oh this is israel da 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 They asked for it. Basically, it's like, why are Jews all over the world in danger then? Right. Why are they in heightened danger? If it's just about Israel, why isn't it just Israelis? But no, you have Jewish schools telling kids to delete their TikTok and Instagram so they don't see these terrorists live streaming the inevitable hostage situation that is going to unfold in the next couple of weeks. You don't you have extra guards at every synagogue. You have open threats from terrorists saying that this Friday is going to be a day of terror. Like this is about the, them being Jews. They don't want them to exist. Mm-hmm. It's so, I don't know that I have no, no moral equivalency for me. It just is like anti-Semitism and it's m- most ugly. And on the left, it's dressed up as progressivism and it's decolonization. Decolonization. Yeah, that mask really came off. Jesus. Yeah. If you think, and it's weird too, because the the right has become like it's bizarre to kind of see everybody. I so I saw Dan Bongino of all people, who's like a very hardcore MAGA very anti-censorship he's invested in rumble he's he believes in kind of creating your parallel economies he's come out hard against like all of the lockdowns and whatnot and then he was like hello friends some of you and i are gonna have to part ways because if you thought i wasn't gonna speak out against this savagery you were wrong because there's a whole faction on the right that's v- become very isolationist and they're like, we don't want to get involved in war. We, like, don't give money to Ukraine. Mm-hmm. It's the upside down, you know, yeah. where the like right wing now is the, they're the like America is an imperial. It's not saying America is an imperialist, but they kind of are. Mm-hmm. They're also like, just, we need to deal with what's going on at home. And, and I understand this. I've been, a lefty you they sound like lefties yeah. which is what's hilarious to me i'm like you guys sound like me when i was 20 and you think this is an original thought yeah you just go learn chinese and shut the fuck up because <laughs> <laughs> the void will be filled it will be filled by someone whether it's russia like here's your multipolar world that you all want which is eventually that power vacuum will be filled. I'm not a warmonger by any means, but I do think that the alternative reality that we would live in if America is not powerful and doesn't stand for Western ideals is Russia, China. Iran. Yeah. Places who are dictators. Uh Uh-huh. And I don't know that like the cushy lives people have lived are aware of that. You know, the, the, it's always like these kid, like it, it's, it's kids too. It's right. usually like YouTubers. 
Right. I'm like, I know I'm retarded on YouTube, but there's so many YouTubers. I'm like, wow, you're actually retarded and you have a huge following. And you have no idea. <laughs> and you have, <laughs> and you're sitting, you've, you've had nothing but the luxurious life of a Westerner. Mm -hmm. And you're like, actually, we shouldn't. It's just bizarre. It's like bizarro world. And then seeing these protests, like, I really didn't want to believe that they were chanting gas the Jews in front of the Sydney Opera House. I, I, I wanted to believe that it was a doctored video. Yeah. Because sometimes they'll chant that at soccer matches. And I was reaching out to my friends in Australia like, is this real? Uh -huh. This is real. I know I've looked at like 20 TikToks, but... Yeah. And then it's so also weird to see how how much stuff that was abstract is is concrete for me now, like Holocaust denial. Mm -hmm. Because you'll see on the left and the right, extreme parts of it, peop the, the whole like, there weren't actually 40 dead babies. N it, not all of them were beheaded, only some of them. It's like insanity. People One who are, beheaded baby is bad enough. <laughs> Can we or, draw the line there? Or just 40 dead babies yeah. and, and demanding to see proof. But then, you know, you get down further down those rabbit holes. It's like, oh, they did this themselves to make Palestine Ugh. and look back. It, it's but this is Holocaust denial. Yeah. It's just like happening in real time. Mm. It's. I don't I don't think people understand enough about the ancient history of anti-Semitism right. and the just battle for survival. Yeah. Of the Jews. <laughs> like we were talking about it where it's just like the country surrounding Israel just want it wiped off the map. Yeah. You know, like that's what they're holding their ground for. They're they're fighting for survival. I mean, honestly, like it, it, that is the dangerous place we're in. As if a, like they were saying today, if Hezbollah gets involved or a few other countries get involved, then you, it's you know we're we're entering into what does never again really mean? You know, it means like not allowing this to happen again. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what it's like to be Jewish. I can't imagine what it was like for those people. I can't imagine what it's like for for anyone who lived through the Holocaust and is still alive. Anyone who has children and sends them to a Jewish school, the fear that you would be in. I can't imagine what it's like for all the P Palestinians who are at normal Palestinians yeah. Trying to live their lives trapped because now Egypt just announced they're not. Most people commenting on this don't even know that they f share a border with Egypt. Right. Like you should have to at least know that to even comment on this situation, which you probably shouldn't be commenting on anyways. If you have some strong take on the, you know, the Jews shouldn't be executed and murdered but like there shouldn't be a but right. after that even across the board in israel even in my friend was just texting me and she's like in my own family there's a secular left-wing jew and there's the across the board they're not in agreement about the politics of all of this they are united by the fact that they're all a persecuted people and there's other religions that literally raise you to hate those people and want them gone. Mm -hmm. And that's not a question. Yasmin Mohammed wrote an amazing piece for Tablet because her father is from Palestine and, and from Gaza and was talking about how he dreamt of, you know, the olive gardens when he grew up and just how beautiful it was and the potential that it had and the two state solution and how basically Hamas ensured that that is not even a potential. And when I, you know, if I look at the kind of Americans commenting on this, it's very flattened like everything. But if you go down kind of one level to Israelis, Palestinians, Arabs, people who live over there, it's a, it's much more nuanced. They live and work together. Right. And as Yasmin was saying, you can't speak out against Hamas. You cannot, even if you do protest some of this, you will be murdered in most of these countries. Right. 
And so the average person is once again, just trying to live their life. Yeah. It's weird to see like the stuff on the left where it's very like the anti-American or the imperialism or how America has been guilty of all these war crimes from American. It, it literally sounds like me in my twenties and I totally understand it. And I'm not saying that it's wrong at all because I, I think there's a lot of truth to it. I just think there's a time and a place to have these discussions and it's not when they're collecting bodies of thousands, hundreds upon hundreds of Jews yeah. Well, the world has witnessed this. Yeah. You know, it's it's not it's not good. It all they it always precedes a world war too. Yeah, I know. This kind of stuff. I know. When you sent that text about Australia, I was like this feels like the beginning of a world war. Well, they it, it is like as people like like Barry and Brett Stevens and all of these people who write about this have said it, it it, the level of anti sem it's like a humanity's immune system. It's a marker. Yeah, yeah. and when when there's rising levels of anti-Semitism, something is off. It's very weird. It will be weird if this ends up, like all of our check-ins kind of end up in the apocalypse, but this one actually feels <laughs> like, <laughs> like the apocalypse. It's heading in that direction. It's just so sad. I just, any one of my friends who's listening, and I reached out to my friend who's Palestinian as well because I know that they're suffering in their own way, and it's any one of my friends who's listening, and I just want you to know you can reach out to me even if you need, even if you need, light hearted stuff or pictures of dogs, you yeah. know, it's something I, my friends in Israel, like just tell us like your mundane stories from your day so that, that to take them out of the heaviness and fear and bomb shelter fatigue, you mm. know? Yeah. We just can't imagine it's normal life for them. We can't imagine. No, we can't. And I want you guys to know that, I stand I stand with Israel and and all of the Jews. Yeah. Which I know I can say now thanks to last week's. Yeah. So many people commented in my on Twitter were like I this happened and I couldn't stop thinking about you asking them about whether or not they were armed cuz I literally assumed everybody in Israel was packing all the time. Uh-huh. And now and now I wish they were. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>